The reading comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 11. Reading from verses 9 to 13. I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's just pray and lift um, the word up to the, uh, to the Lord. So, Father God, we pray for your Holy Spirit now to mm. fall upon him and to anoint him with the word that you've placed on his heart. We pray that you will grant him your peace they may be sensitive to your spirit. We pray for power in your word, and we pray for our hearts that we would, they would be open to you. And so, Father, we just praise you for this word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, in case you'd missed it, uh, Wednesday was a big day, but probably not for the first reason that's come to your mind right now. Some people have stayed up till midnight and welcomed in the new year. For me, I was fast asleep and unfortunately got woken up by some fireworks, which made me quite grumpy. I personally don't do new year. I don't see the point of it. I thank God every day when I get up. It doesn't have to just be once every 365 days. So you may be thinking, well, why was Wednesday such a big day? Well, it was day eight of Christmas. It was the day when we celebrate the naming and the circumcision of Jesus, the Christ child. Jewish tradition is that a baby is named eight days after birth. And in Luke 2, it tells us that Jesus was circumcised those eight days after his birth, and he was given his name. So why is that so important? Well, it reminds us that Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, fully divine, is also fully human. It reminds us why Jesus came. And it allows us to stop and remember who Jesus was in the midst of all the parties that will have inevitably been going on. It reminds us to stop. And it is eight days of Christmas on Wednesday. We're now on, I think, 11 or 12, because officially tomorrow is Epiphany, the 6th of January, when we celebrate the Magi arriving to see the the baby Jesus, who is probably now a toddler, in a house in Bethlehem. In our world, we talked about it a lot in Advent, didn't we? Christmas is about one day. But we remind ourselves that today we are still in Christmas season, hence the tree, hence the window. It will be coming down later today or tomorrow. So we remember that we had still, Christmas is not just that one day, it is the full 12 days of celebration. We as a church have hopefully been following the star through the booklets given out or through the app on our phones and enjoying those 12 days of Christmas wonder. But we may be feeling now that we followed the star, we've arrived, so what comes next? Well, now the true work of Christmas begins. You might not be able to read that. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, 
to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nation, to bring peace among brothers, and to make music in the heart. I'm not sure who wrote that, but to me, it's about as good a summary as I could think of, of what Christmas is really about. And I think this really helps us as we start to look at what our vision is going to be going forward for Christchurch. Throughout this month of January, we'll be spending time at our church, in, in church, looking at our vision, looking at what God is calling us to do in 2020 and beyond. But it's something we can't rush. It's something that's going to take time. It's going to take time as we pray together, as we discern together, as we compile everything that comes out, as we review it, and as we launch it. Now, I anticipate that we will hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, we'll be in a position to actually launch vision at Easter time. So it's not something that's going to be done in the next week or the next month. It will take us time. So I anticipate that we'll be in a position to launch our vision in around mid-April. So it may be that as a church, we spend a lot of time talking about it through January, but then it might go quiet. But I want to assure you that even if there's nothing said at the front, things are still happening in the background. The PCC will compile everything that we look at over the next few weeks and we will come together and pray together, probably have a day away and look at a vision. And then we'll need to pray and test that vision. And if we launch at Easter, if everything goes to plan, we'll then spend time testing that until summer and then praying and discerning again. Is this really what God wants us to do? If it is, great, we carry on. If not, we revisit So this coming week, as we come together in our evenings to pray into the vision, it is very much just the beginning. It marks the beginning of a journey for us as a church. Since I've started, we've spoken a lot about this new season that we're in. Well, now it's time to really press in and see what does God want us to do in this new season. So we need to essentially get from where we are now to where we want to be. To where we are now, January, 5th of January, 2020, to where we want to be. But actually, it's not about that. It's about that. It's not about where we want to be as a church. It's about where God wants us to be. It's not about each and every one of us going, my vision is this, I want this to happen. That's not what this season is about. This season is about discerning what does God want us to do. We may need to change direction as we go, and that's fine. And as we go through this season of exploring the vision and seeing where we're going, I don't anticipate it to be an easy time. As we're pressing into what the Lord wants us to be doing, we will face attack, we will face opposition, we will face resistance from the enemy. So we all need to be on guard and putting on our spiritual armor and being ready to fight this battle. We're seeking what the Lord's will is and the enemy won't want us to do that. So he certainly won't want us to be successful. We ourselves might feel slightly uneasy as we go through this vision process and think, well, are things going to change? How are things going to change? Because friends, there will be change. It will come. But as and when it does, I want to encourage you to not lose sight of that vision. To not lose sight of what the Lord is calling us to do. We need to keep our eyes fixed on what is to come. Not on the here and the now. And not in the past. This vision season is not about, well, we used to do all of this. Let's start doing it again. It may not be that's the season that God's taken us. And that's the direction that God's taken us. So we need to be praying against attacks from the enemy. We need to be praying for each and every one of us as we go through this season. And we need to be praying for that vision and mission action plan that is truly what the Lord wants Christchurch to do 
and how we can further the work of the kingdom. And during the week I came across this quote, which I think summarizes it perfectly as we start a vision, that we need to end our preoccupation with member preferences and the way we've always done it, and instead focus relentlessly on the church's mission and purpose. So this month, as we go through this vision, and in the subsequent months, I hope that we'll be encouraged to focus not just on ourselves as a church, not just on us as an individual, but actually to be thinking, well, where does God want us in the community? So this vision process is about where are we now? How do we get to where God wants us to be? But also, how do we get to where God wants us to be in the community? Because that's just as important. We'll look at the ways we already serve our community, and we do so in so many ways. But we also need to look at other ways that we can serve, other ways that we can help our community. And it may be that things emerge through the next four nights or even beyond. But it's really good that we have this space that we can offer to the community. On Christmas Eve, Steve, Leslie and I were sat in the foyer having a coffee. And someone came in from one of the groups and handed a Christmas card. And they said, thank you. It's really good to have this space to use, or something along those lines. And as she left, Steve said to me, that fills me with joy. Because when we were planning this building, we wanted it to be a space for the community. Friends, this building is a real asset. Not just to us as Christchurch, but to the community of Bushmead. And I want to explore the ways that we can make the most of it. On Christmas Day, we had somebody come in and feed, I think it was about 35 people who would have otherwise been on their own or homeless. And they had a lovely time. And the feedback was, people sense the spirit of God in this place. That's what we need to be celebrating. That's what we need to be seeking. Because as we all know, that our society is polarized and it's a bitterly divided culture. But it's us who follow the Prince of Peace that can model peace, forgiveness, respect, and civility. That's what we need to be modeling when the community comes into us. We won't always agree on things that are happening. We will have our own thoughts and ideas, and they may be opposing, they may differ. They may differ to what the community wants. But even though within our congregation, as we do this, we may find that we're thinking different things, what we can do is still show everyone on the outside that we respect each other, that we love each other, that we care for each other, that we are a community that reflects the Prince of Peace. Once we get to around May time and Letton Hall, we'll be spending time looking at the gifts that God has given us. And how we can best serve the church. It'll be a chance for us all individually. And those that aren't going to Letton Hall, we'll be doing this, we'll do this at another time as well. But it'll be a chance to stop and think, well, actually, how can I serve the church in the best way? What gifts has God given me? I know there are people who are sat here in this congregation today that want to do more. I equally know there's people sat here in this congregation that are doing far too much and might need to give up some things to allow others to serve in different ways. So we need to spend time looking at that and seeing how can we each contribute to the life of Christ Church. So I've talked a lot about the vision and about these next few months and how that might look for us as a church. What about the Bible passage we had today? It's, if you've done your Follow the Star booklet this morning, we'll realize it's the passage that has been used for today. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Well, isn't that exactly what we're wanting to do as we start this process of looking at the vision and the mission action plan? It's not that we're going to come up with something that we ourselves want to do. But for it to succeed, it has to be something that we are all behind, that we are all together on, 
But most importantly, it has to be something that is from the Lord. We need to be asking the Lord, what does he want us to do? What's his vision for this place? We know that he's faithful. The passage says he will answer us. Of course, we know it's not always, and it usually isn't, the way we would want it to be answered. So we may have our ideas now of what we want this vision to be, but we need to be prepared to change direction if it's not how the Lord answers us. And we need to remember that through that, it's because the Lord has the bigger picture in mind. None of us know the big picture. It's almost like, yeah, I can't remember, I think it might be Corrie ten Boom that talks about the tapestry. That God sees the tapestry from the top, the beauty of it all. We are one strand in that, and from underneath we just see the mess. We need to remember that as we go through this season. As the Follow the Star booklet says, searching for something takes energy and commitment. For us, this next season will take energy. It will take commitment. As we discern what the Lord is asking of us. Through Advent we looked at the book of Luke. And I want to ask you to make the commitment this morning with me. To go through the book of Acts over this vision month. We'll be looking at Acts through our series through January on church. On Sundays and Wednesdays. Small groups will be looking at Acts during the month as well. To see how we can bring that church alive today. And it also serves as a wonderful sequel to Luke, same author. So over this coming week, I want to encourage you to not only be praying as we gather in an evening, but make a commitment to pray at other times too. I know we are all busy. I know we all have very busy lives and it's hard to find time sometimes. But there are different ways we show the commitment. Dean spoke at the start of the service about fasting. It may be if you're fasting from a TV show, you spend that half an hour in prayer. However you do it, I just encourage you, maybe it's as you read your Bible on your own, spend an extra 10 minutes praying for Christ Church and the vision. A lot of the next four nights we'll be praying and seeking and discerning the Lord's will. But it doesn't stop there. There will be then opportunities for each and every person in this congregation to feed into this process. Because the vision will fail and the mission action plan will fail if it's my vision, if it's my mission action plan. It will fail if it's the PCC's vision and their mission action plan. It has to be Christ Church. It has to be everybody involved in this. And I think, Dean, you said at the start, it's not top-down. Actually, it is top-down. It's top-down from the Lord. It's top-down from the Lord, but it's bottom-up from us. So I want you to hear that this morning. And I don't think, going back to the passage we had, it's coincidence that it comes just after Jesus has taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, which is the basis of all of our prayers, It's a prayer that we should be saying regularly. It's a prayer that we will be saying here more regularly going forward. But what we get after the Lord's Prayer is Jesus showing us that we need to be persistent in prayer. We should seek him. We should have a prayer life that's not just the routine or formal sort of going through the motions of prayer as a daily or a weekly task, hopefully daily. But a prayer life that's aware of the battle that is going on around us. A prayer life that recognizes we are in a fight with the enemy. A prayer life that fights for peace, for reconciliation, for wisdom, for the church, for the world, for our family, for our friends. And a prayer life that includes praying for ourselves. As we're often too selfish to pray for ourselves. That might seem overwhelming. Well, even Tom Wright says, there are, of course, too many things to pray about. That's why we need to be disciplined and regular in our prayer. And the first part of chapter 11, the little bit before Diane read into the bit that she did read, is where we go today, because it gives us a few lessons on prayer. 
It shows us that prayer is important. It's the importance of prayer. Jesus prayed. And his disciples say, teach us to pray. We're then shown the substance of prayer, which is the Lord's Prayer. Granted in the shorter format in Luke. But it is the Lord's Prayer. We're then shown the practice of prayer, that we need to pray regularly. And finally, we're then shown the basis of prayer, which is God's part in all of this. To the text we had reminds us, pray persistently. Not because God will not answer otherwise, but we need to pray persistently as if he wouldn't answer. This is the practice of prayer, and it's our part in it. The basis of prayer, or if you like, God's part in it, shows that he does answer. But he won't answer in a bad way, as the reading says, and give us a snake or a scorpion. Thank goodness, because I'm afraid of snakes. But God will answer, and he will give us good things. In verse 13, he will give us the Holy Spirit. In chapter 10 of Luke, Jesus is explaining the way, the way to God. It's a way of single-minded devotion to him. Not a matter of achievement. It's not a matter of attitude. It's a matter of bringing all that we are under the sovereignty of the Lord. And when we seek him with all of our hearts, we find that God is our Father who meets our seeking, meets the way we seek with giving. So therefore, when we go to him and ask, seek and knock, he gives the answer that we need. Ultimately, the gift of the Father is the Holy Spirit. That's what matters. We know that when we come to the Lord, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. But we know too that this isn't just a one-time thing when we first confess Jesus is Lord. As we read in Ephesians, we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So as we journey on into this vision, as we spend time looking at Acts together corporately, I want to encourage you in your prayer life, be asking the Lord to fill you afresh with his Holy Spirit. Ask for it daily. Ask for it more than once a day. Ask to be filled continuously with the Holy Spirit. Because if you stop and think, I wonder when was the last time you actually asked the Lord to fill you with his Holy Spirit? Jesus tells us the Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So over these next four evenings, we'll be doing just that. There will be times when we'll be asking the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us. We'll be seeing what the Lord wants to do in that. Because we need to seek him first. We need to put him first before we start looking at what he wants us to do. So today is very much the start of the journey that we're on together. It's very much the beginning, Epiphany Sunday, when we celebrate the arrival of the Magi to visit Jesus. They've been on a journey from home to Bethlehem following a star. Often we think of that as the end of the journey, but it's only halfway through because they have to go back home again. And we know they go back home a different way because they've been warned not to return to Herod. So for us, as we begin this journey, in some ways, we're stepping away from home. We're going on a journey. Probably not following a star, but we'll be following the Lord in whatever way that appears. We go away from our comfortable place. We seek and discern together what the Lord wants us to do. And then we return home. But we will return home via a different route, like the Magi. And home, church, if you like, will possibly look different. And that's okay. That is okay. When we go on a journey, I'm sure you all prepare well. And I want us to prepare well at the outset of our journey together. I want us to prepare well by praying over the coming days. Really listening to the Lord and seeing what he wants us to do here. I've said it before, when I looked at the profile, when I came for interview and since starting, I have seen the amazing potential that there is in this place. 
With all of you sat here, there is so much potential. And I want to press into that potential. And it really, really excites me going forward where the Lord will take us. As Dean alluded to, there was quite a lot of words and pictures this morning about our vision and our planning and our journey. And it reminded me of a, of a quote that we used to say at Ridley when I was training. It was roots down, walls down, bridges out. One of the pictures was of almost like us being in a courtyard with big thick walls and people walking past not seeing in. Well, as we journey through, we have to have our roots down, our roots in the Lord, our roots in the church. As we put our roots down, we then take our walls down, not literally. Don't worry, I'm not saying we need to get rid of the church. (laughs) But we put our, our metaphorical walls down so that the community can see us. The community can see us involved in things in the community. And then we can put our bridges out and say, well, come and join us. Come and join us at church. Come and learn about the Lord. Come and make that commitment for yourself. That's how we do this. So if I show you, if we come back to that slide, it's where we are now. It's where God wants us to be. It's where God wants us to be in the community. And it's also, where does God want me? We all have a part to play in the life of this church in whatever form. We all come with different gifts, with different talents. We all have a part to play. And if you're sat here today thinking, I don't know what I can contribute, then I encourage you to pray and ask the Lord how you can help, because you can. We all come together to form the church. We need one another to function. Just before Christmas, as we were praying as a staff team, Steve had a picture which I'm going to invite him to share with us now. So I think it's very relevant as we begin this journey together. We meet regularly for prayer, staff prayer. And um, during the prayer, I found myself studying, studying a large box of candles. The candles that we, we have on the Lord's table for Christmas. Big ones, smaller ones, some that are new, some that have been burnt for many hours. And I was looking at that, and I suddenly thought, well, all of these candles, there's short ones, long ones, regardless of what size they are, colour, whatever, When they're lit, they give exactly the same light as you see there. So what I'm saying is that every one of us, wherever we are in our walk, whether you're young, old, might be feeling slightly burnt out perhaps, but when that light is lit, we all have that same light to offer. So everybody has something to offer wherever their walk with the Lord is. Thank you, Steve. So we each have our part to play. And don't worry if you think you've blown it. I also came across this this week. If you think you've blown God's plan for your life, rest in this. You, my beautiful friend, are not that powerful. (laughs) God can and will use our experiences, good and bad. God will guide and direct us. We just have to be willing to do so. The Magi were willing to follow the star to Bethlehem. We are willing to follow, are we willing to follow the Lord personally and corporately? After all, it's only 11 days ago that we celebrated Jesus Christ coming to dwell among us as Emmanuel, God with us. It's not a one-time thing we celebrate once a year. It's something we celebrate each and every single day of our lives that Jesus Christ is with us. Amen.